Hi family and welcome back to Wisdom for Life. My name is Brittany and I'm so happy to be joining you this morning. This week we've been taking a look at the way of the kingdom of God. It is so powerful to know that we have rights and responsibilities as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. God has made so many promises available to us. We just need to apply the principles that he's laid out in his word and we will walk in his prosperity. So let's continue learning together. When Jesus died on the cross, not only did he take your sin, but he bore every sickness and every disease, every pain, every sorrow, every form of tragedy that could possibly hit your life. He's already borne the grief of that thing. He bore, he, even though he was rich for your sake, became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich that He has done everything that you need pertaining to life and godliness. He paid for it in full on that cross and then rose from the dead, proving not only are your sins forgiven, but that you have the entire kingdom given to you. And the way we receive that kingdom is by faith. And God says it very clearly here in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you. Isn't it interesting that he would say he's calling them as witnesses against us? Surely if somebody's testifying, you want the witness to bear out what they're saying is true. And God is literally taking his word and saying, I have given you my word. And I'm willing to be exposed before all of heaven and all of earth. How many of you know that God's not someone who's trying to hide things from us? He's not trying to, he doesn't say one thing, and then when it doesn't work out for his favor, he tries to do it in a different way. No, he says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He says that he'll uphold his word higher than his own name. God says, have I not said it, and will I not do it? In other words, God's integrity is beyond reproach. There is nothing you'll ever catch God on and saying, God, but you said Every time I've landed up in that situation where things seem to be going wrong in my life and I've gone to the Word and said, but God, you said. What I've done is through that time, I've noticed that I, there's different ways that God has dealt with me on that. But every single time it's come back to the place where God, you are never wrong. You are never wrong. I've missed it somewhere. And when I trust God in that sense and say, Father, then show me where I've missed it. Every time I've gone with that humility, God has shown me in His Word, this is what you ought to have done. And every time I've corrected that, I've seen the Word come through. Every single time. And I want to encourage you that when God lays this before us, He is exposing Himself, and He's saying, this is who I am. I'm not a man that I would lie. Now I'm asking you to stand before heaven and earth and make a decision. And he says, yeah, I'll set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And notice he doesn't say, well, now it's just chance, whatever happens. You never know what God's going to do. Um, there's life and death, and, you know, I just hope it turns out right for you. Good luck. No, God says, I'll lay before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose. Choose life. Family of God, if he says choose life, that means you and I have a decision that it is possible to choose death. Someone might say, but why would anyone ever do that? Well, the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. That's why it's important that we know what the Word of God says on any issue, because other, if we don't know what the Word of God says, all that we're left with is popular opinion. Whatever media is driving, whatever people are saying to us, whatever our friends are saying. And, and it's very easy to slip into listening to the same thing over and over and over and say, well, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe it's not. And you notice how even things that were considered outright sin is that there's a great move in the world today to legislate against that. That uh, you would seem to be out of place if you ever called something like that a sin. 
And family God, we as the church must uphold the standard. We're not adapting and becoming malleable to the world to try and look as close to the world as possible so that maybe somehow they'll accept us. No, we're not waiting for the church. We're not waiting for people to accept the church. We as the church set the standard. God's already set it in His Word. And as we set that standard in our lives and we live our lives accordingly and we make a choice for life and then see God's word and God's miracles come through, it is the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. Not when I try to look like them and make our, our, our church building feel like a club, then at least they're comfortable with coming. You know, there's nothing wrong with nice music and lights and, and de demonstration, you know, like a like, uh, uh, TVs and things like that, and you know, um, audiovisual stuff. Nothing wrong with using that, but we're never going to compromise on the word, never compromise on the message. And I want to live my life where people may turn around and say, that's been bigoted, or that's, ain't, you know, that's, that's whatever they may say, that's very closed minded. But praise God, this closed minded man has his every sickness healed, has his bills paid. Has God providing, living a life according to the life of God? How many of you re echo that and say amen for your life as well? And then when the hard times come, when the tough times come, and the rest of the world starts collapsing and buckling at the knees, they will see who's still standing, and that's going to draw people to want to know, who is this God that you serve? When I used to laugh at you because everything seemed fine, now the world's in a mess and you still standing, smiling and rejoicing? Got to be something to the God that you serve. And the goodness of God leads men to repentance. Say that, the goodness of God leads men to repentance. And notice he says, yeah, choose life. So it is your and my choice that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God that you obey His voice, that you may cling to Him, for He is your life and the length of your days. Hallelujah. Come have a look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Yeah, Timothy, uh, Paul is dealing with Timothy and he's just got through speaking about uh, the love of money and pursuing things of this world instead of the kingdom of God. Remember, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All the things will be added to you. And then Paul says to Timothy, he says, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. These are things, family of God, that we want to pursue. These are the things we want to live for. And then he says in verse 12, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Notice he says, fight the good fight of faith. Family of God, how many realize faith is a fight? Faith is a fight. Uh, you know, sometimes people have this impression now that they're Christian and they hear the message of faith, well, now all their problems are over. If that's what I interpret out of a message, I haven't listened to the message correctly, or whoever's teaching it hasn't taught it correctly. If anyone told you your problems are over now that you're a Christian, they, they, they lied to you. Because there is a fight. There is a fight. Now, we mustn't be nervous about that because sometimes you tell me, well, it's going to be a fight, and then you think they'll walk away. No, not being in the fight of faith is far worse. You're going to be in a fight either way. But if, you want, if somebody wants to be in a fight where they're destroyed and they're under and they, they, they're damaged and messed up, they lose their health, their finances, that's on the outside of the kingdom of God where you have no covenant. And the Bible even talks about a way to get rich. But when God says when the, the kingdom of God makes you rich, the blessing makes you rich, He adds no sorrow with it. Why would the word say that? Because even though the world may get to a place where they've got lots of money, there's a lot of heartache and sorrow and all kinds of other thing, problems come with it as well. When you make a choice for the kingdom of God, it is going to be a fight. But you notice Paul says, it's a good fight. It's a good fight. I don't know about you, if I'm going to get into a fight, I want to be in the good one. You're going to have a fight. Let me put it that way. You are going to have a fight. It's not like you're going to get away with it. I know we come here for good news. Well, that's the good news. 
Not that you're going to be in a fight, but the fight that you're in is a good one. Oh, come on. I want to be in the good fight. How you say amen to that? What's the good fight? The fight of faith. The fight of faith. Now, why would the fight of faith be a good fight? Because it's a fight you've already won. Oh, come on, you got to get, it's not something like you're going to win. You know, when you, when you watch a rugby match or soccer match or, or even think of boxing as an actual hands-on fight, why do you think people watch sport? Because they don't know who's going to win. That's why you shout and scream every time your team gets anywhere near the line. Everybody begins shouting and screaming, and, and then they turn, they go away, and, and you're telling them how they should have played and why they didn't. Why is that? Because you don't know what the outcome's going to be. But here's the thing. When David looked at Goliath, he knew the result. He, to him, it wasn't a problem. Everybody else was in fear. Why? They thought they might die today. David went running at his enemy because there was no way he was going to die today because God's already got the battle. He's already fought it. He's already won it. All I got to do is go and finish it off. Oh, hallelujah. You got to get a hold of that. See, family, you already have your breakthrough. You already have your miracle. You already have your healing. You already have your provision. That home you trust in God for, it already exists. You already have what you need. That job is yours. Whatever, family of God, get a hold of that. It's a good fight. The outcome's already determined. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. I, I, you know, I, I so much would like you to be in the building. I could then get more excited. But for now, just, just excuse me for my calmness. You know, I just, I need crowd to get excited. Hallelujah. <laughs> James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Hallelujah. How can you land up in a battle and get excited? Because you know the outcome. See, count it joy. I'm not saying be happy. I know what it's like to be attacked. And I mean, all your happiness is stripped because happiness is determined by natural circumstances. But joy is a fruit of the Spirit. You born again? Are you born again? Then joy is inside of you. But now I have to count it joy. When something happens in my life, I've got to say, Lord, I, the joy of the Lord is my strength. If I'm going to be strong in this fight, I'm not going in there with my own natural ability. Come on. How, how many of you know how to, in a physical fight, you know, I mean, you probably, I don't know if you were at school and got into, you know, they call them Barney matches and things like that. And, you know, you, we, people start knocking each other around. Kids have fun, you know, play, whether it's play or serious. But you, you know kind of how to hit somebody if you want to hurt them. Isn't that right? Now, how are you going? Now, let me just say this so that we don't get wrong. I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying you, you would know how to, if somebody attacked you, you'd know physically how to defend yourself, I'm sure. But how do you do that with the devil? If the devil attacks, where, where do you tackle him? Where do you hit him? What, what would you do? See, in the natural, there's no way of doing it. So my own physical strength, I don't care whether I am, uh, uh, you know, a fifth Dan karate person I, and the devil attacks, you, you, you're not going to be able to stop him with your karate. You can have the biggest gun on the planet. You can have, I don't care if it's a tank or whatever. You, where do you shoot the devil to take him down? No, the strength is not ours. I said the strength is not ours. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. That strength comes from the inner man. Strengthened in the inner man. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So when I face Satan, I'm not facing him in how well my mind is and how peaceful I feel or how strong I feel for that day. Oh, I, got I don't feel like attacking the devil today. No, the joy, I count the joy. I don't care how hard and fast the attacks come. I know what it's like to be hit and to be hit and to be hit and to be hit and to be hit. And you think, when is this going to stop? I cannot afford to allow my joy to fall. I have to count a joy. You just don't understand, Pastor Allen. Oh, yes, I do. I'm not speaking from a place of not being there. I have been there. 
I know what it feels like. But I do know this, that when you make a decision to stand on this word and do exactly as he says here, count it joy. That's the decision you and I have to make. Well, it's not easy. It is. It's a decision. Well, let me put it this way. It may not be easy, but it's real simple. It's a yes or a no. I have to make a decision. I'm counting this attack as joy. Why? Knowing this. Here's why it becomes easy. Knowing this, that the testing of your faith produces patience. And then let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, listen to this now, lacking nothing. How many of you wouldn't mind some lacking nothing in your life? Now look what you signed up for. If we want lacking nothing, we have to go through this process of patience. And patience only happens when we endure through a fight of faith. You getting this? See, I know what it's like to say, Lord, I need this answer, and I needed it yesterday. Come on, how many of you wouldn't mind the miracle to have happened last week or last month? Well, of course we do. But here's the thing. There's a key to this patience. Remember Hebrews 6 verse 12. Do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. See, it's very easy, you know, you've got to understand this, that uh, as a preacher, as a teacher of the Word, you very often use examples from your life. Now, how do you know people don't have a time to, to go through the, the five-year message? You know, this, this took me 10 years and go through every single process of the 10 years. So very often, it's a very summated, is that a right word? <laughs> it's a summation of uh, of, the, of the testimony. So, you know, this happened, and then that happened, and then we went to see the doctor, and then the doctor said, and I said, and then blah, blah, and I had, hallelujah, now we healed. It can sound like, you know, you just had to get in there and just say something. And boom, boom, you know, it sounds like it took a day or two. Sometimes miracles, there are miracles that Janine and I stood in place faithful for nine years. But I can't, how do you, how do you put that across in a message? That it took nine years. People say, wow, you know, faith's easy for you. God just does things for you. Yeah, He does. But it's not always overnight. Amen. Praise God. And so, standing in faith takes that place where you need to say, God, I'm trusting you. And when everything happens that seems contradictory, I still know your word's true. And then things sometimes seem like they get worse. God, your word says. That's patience. That's patience. Sometimes people don't see that happening in your life. They don't need to see that because it's not about what people see or think. I'm teaching it to you today so that you know that you're not on your own. These are things that we've all been through. And so if you see somebody who has inherited the promise, know this, that they have been through faith and patience. You see someone with a testimony, with a miracle in their life, there is a faith and patience. And so we learn from the faith aspect, but we also have to recognize there's a patience. There's an endurance to that fight. See, Mark chapter 4, come and have a look at verse 13. As you know, this is one of my favorite portions of Scripture, because Jesus said, in verse 13, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? And so they were questioning him on what he had just taught. And he said, if you don't get this principle, then how are you going to understand anything else I teach? In other words, this is a foundation. This is a first principle here. If you get this first, all the other teachings are going to fall into place. That would make this a key parable. This unlocks the secrets, the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And let's have a look what he said here. Verse 14, the sower sows the word. The cross-reference says it's the word of God. Everybody say the word of God. 
He says here, verse 15, These are the ones sown by the wayside. When the word is sown, they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise, in other words, it's also word sown in the heart, and Satan taken it immediately, but there's a slightly different process. He says they are sown on stony ground. When they hear the word, they receive it with gladness. However, they have no root in themselves, and so they only endure for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. In fact, the old King James Version uses the word, they are offended. They are offended. Why would they be offended? Because they heard the word preached, and they said, amen. They made their notes. They posted their, their, their Twitter and their tweet and everything else about what, how awesome the message was, and they trusted, and then all of a sudden the tribulation and the persecution came, and the fight came, and the bell rang, and they got into the fight, and it seemed like it didn't work the way they expected. And they're going, but this isn't what Pastor Allen, I, I didn't sign up for this. He didn't tell me this would happen. No, I am. That's why you are in this house, I can tell you. So when these things happen, you go, oh, I was warned about this. Because if you don't understand these principles that Satan comes to attack, he's not coming because he hates you. What's the devil got against me? Nothing. He doesn't care if you go to heaven or hell. He doesn't care where you go. Because even if you go to hell, people got this idea that Satan's trying to populate hell, so he's got something to rule. No, when Satan is assigned to hell for eternity, he is in his own domain, in that bottomless pit, and there's absolutely no one that he will ever see ever again. He's not ruling hell. Got to get a hold of this. He doesn't care if you go to heaven or hell, just as long as you're not on this planet. Because while you're on the planet... You're a threat to him as long as you got the Word of God in your mouth. It's the Word that will stop him. See, Jesus didn't stop the devil as the man Jesus. He said, it is written. When the devil attacked him and tempted him, he didn't say, excuse me, I'm God. I created you and you're tempting me. Ah, oh, you can't tempt God. Did he do that? No, he said, it is written. So if it's written, means he read it. He had his eyes on it, and he heard it. And that's the exact same tool you and I have. When Jesus went about teaching and demonstrating the kingdom of God, he revealed many principles that govern the kingdom of God. Why was Jesus so successful? Through various examples from the Word of God, Alan Back shares what our responsibilities and the benefits are as citizens of God's kingdom as well as a member of the household of faith. The Word of God says that we must be imitators of God. In this series, Alan Bagg reveals how to apply the principles of the kingdom of God so we can experience prosperity and success. God wants us to enjoy the same life He has. Well, family God, the only way it's going to work is if we do what God does. Discover the way of the kingdom of God. Learn how to operate powerfully in God's kingdom and discover how to live a good life and experience what God has made available to you. People getting healed and delivered. We saw provision beyond anything that made sense in the natural. Thousands of people getting fed. We've seen people raised from the dead, walking on water. That is the kind of response that one can expect if you understand the way of the kingdom of God. Discover the way of the kingdom of God. Order your series by visiting us online at allenbagministries.org or by making contact with us here at any of our details. Wow, wasn't that amazing? The kingdom of God is such a broad subject. There are so many promises from God in His Word for us in our lives. This series is a 12-part series. You can just see how much information is jam-packed in here. We aren't able to show it all on these broadcasts, but you can get your hand on a copy and continue your study of the way of the kingdom of God. You can contact us at the details below and place your order so that you can be empowered by this series. Well, my friend, 
we know that one of the principles in the kingdom of God is prayer. And Jesus said, whatever we ask for in his name, and we believe we receive it, we will have it. So I'd like to pray that with you right now. Let's close our eyes together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises that are filled through your word to us. I thank you that no matter what our friends and partners are trusting for, no matter what they're believing for, you have success planned for them. I thank you that as they apply these principles to their lives, they will see your prosperity and success in their lives in Jesus name. Amen. Now God answers prayer and when that happens in your life, please let us know. We'd love to hear your testimonies. You can contact us at the details below and we'd love to celebrate what God has done in your life. Well family, that's all we have time for today. Join us again tomorrow as we continue to study the Kingdom of God. My name is Brittany, reminding you that Jesus is Lord. Life is a choice. Choose life. With a call to equip believers to flourish in their ministries, Alan and Janine Bank are the senior pastors of the Bay Christian Family Church, one church in many locations. Many locations, one church, one vision. It is one church multiple locations people connecting with people wherever you're able to join the family at the bay christian family church this weekend for amazing times in god's presence and faith building times in god's life-changing word if you're not close to any of our locations feel free to participate in our online services over the weekend at allenbagministries.org Alan Bag Ministries is making the series that featured as this week's Wisdom for Life programs available to you for purchase. If you missed any of this week's programs or if this week's Wisdom for Life programs have helped you, we encourage you to purchase the series featured on this week's Wisdom for Life programs and have them available to strengthen your faith when needed. Yeah.